Amen. Well, I've found in my life that it's a whole lot easier to start something than to finish something. Anybody in here? A lot, whole lot easier to finish, or excuse me, to, to start something than to finish. Um, I'll give you an example. I remember when the kids uh, were about to be born, and we had this house, and we had this really cool idea for a nursery. And at first, you have this idea of, like, awesome, it's gonna be sick, dude, we're gonna paint it this way, we'll paint it halfway up, there'll be a little border there, it'll be great, you know, and I'm like, yeah, and I started out, and I'm like, dude, I, am t- I suck at painting. <laughs> and it was like this real, like, thick paint, and I'm like, I'm getting, spilling stuff everywhere, and I'm like, bro, I, I got nothing, I need some help. Anybody, right? You've been right in the middle of a project. In fact, you're in the middle of the project right now. Don't elbow your spouse right now, okay? It's been, it's been waiting to get done for a while. You started it with gusto, with fervor. Let's go. And now it's all, everything's just sitting there. No? Okay, that, that didn't work. All right, how about this one? When you first started out in your relationship, hey, talk about on fire, Man, you are up all night long, texting back and forth. What's that app that the young kids Snapchatting all night long, back and forth, and you start off on fire, but then somewhere along the way, you kind of just fizzle out, and you disconnect. It's such a wild thing. I think about our relationship with God and how many people start off on fire, but they don't finish. And I just tell you, man, as a pastor, it breaks your heart because, again, why do we start this church for God's best? We we just want you to experience God's best. We don't want you just to begin and, and to start, but, man, we want you to thrive and to finish the race with joy. Recently, there was a revival that broke out at this college called Asbury College. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody see that? And then it kind of spread really all throughout the nation. And I mean, just thousands of people would just pack this place. And I think, I don't know, for a good chunk of the month of February, I mean, thousands of people were flooding in, worshiping God. People are coming to Christ, repenting of sin, and they're, they're starting the journey. But as a pastor, I'm always thinking, okay, and amazing, and by the way, I love a good time. Who loves a good time? I mean, come on. I love the good feelings and the, you know, I'm a YOLO guy. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm always sending it. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm really looking not just to send it at the beginning, but man, I wanna, I wanna finish the race with joy. I, I, don't wanna, I, I don't wanna fizzle out. In the late 60s, early 70s, there was this movement called the Jesus Movement. Anybody familiar with it? The Jesus, where my Jesus people at, right? And they just made a movie called The Jesus Revolution. If you haven't seen it, I, I, I encourage you to go see it. And one of the people that God used in this movement was a guy named Chuck Smith and another dude named Lonnie Frisbee. Chuck Smith started the very first Calvary Chapel Church way back in California. And that movement that began way back then, this huge revival, is continuing today. In fact, you're still, you're in it. You didn't know it. This is the Calvary Chapel. So the the, the way it started, yeah, there's, yeah, Pastor Chuck and Lonnie, you know, just pointing to Jesus. I mean, they'd have all kinds of people come to the ocean and being baptized. But the beauty of it, man, check this out. It didn't just start and fizzle out. It continues this day. And I'm just gonna submit something real simple today. To me, the key in the entire thing is one day at a time connected to Christ in the scriptures. The beauty of the Calvary Chapel movement is all Chuck did, he would sit on a little stool and he'd just teach right through from Genesis to Revelation. He had no flash, he had no fizz, the dude was bald, just broke open the Bible, just talking about, yo, we're in Genesis. Let's turn now to Genesis chapter and just taught through the Bible and told his people, hey, you read and then we'll talk about it. You read and we'll talk about it. That's it. It's so cool that some of the Jesus people from the 70s are at our church today. 
In fact, we just did their story. Ken and Michelle are actually on the front row. Some of the Jesus people. <laughs> so cool. If you haven't checked out their story on the podcast, go check it out. Started off smuggling Bibles into China, fell in love. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome story, by the way? <laughs> How'd you meet? You know, I was smuggling Bibles. <laughs> kind of like what you do. And it's so beautiful. I look at them and I'm like, even through a disease that, that Ken's dealing with, I just look at their marriage. I just want to honor you guys. I just, I love when people don't just start, but they finish. And you guys are the real deal. And why is it? It's the grace of God and the word of God. It's so beautiful. Race finishers. It's so interesting. There's one verse for me personally, my call. It's really helped me a ton because I'm not just looking. Now, this is a good time. Listen, the band, how about the band? Like, thank you, God, for the, the gifts the band has. Thank you for what we get to do. It's a beautiful thing that we get to do. But listen, I want you to, to, to finish strong. Not flash in the pan Christianity, but finishing the race Christianity. This verse has been so helpful, John 15, 16. Watch this. <laughs> Jesus, you didn't choose, he's saying this. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And this is what he told his disciples. I appointed you to go and produce, here it is, lasting fruit. That's what I've set out to do. And lasting fruit, you guys experiencing, thriving, like sending it for Jesus, man, enjoying life through the, through the good and the bad, and staying in the game for the long haul and finishing your race with joy. It, earlier in John 15, verse five, Jesus says this. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who, what does it say, church? Those who remain in me and I in them, they will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nada. That's Espanol for nothing. Spanish speakers. Did you see it? It's, so, it's not rocket science. It's you want to stay in it for the long haul, stay connected. Chuck would always, would always joke around. He'd say, um, go, go like watch a fruit tree, like the apple hanging on the tree, and just see if it's sweating. In other words, the apple is like, mm, I got to grow. Mm, sweating. You know, orange, whatever. Name, name your thing on a, on a tree. What is it doing? It's just hanging in there, man. Just staying connected. And what happens? The word of God just get, begins to, to grow you and fruit in your life. Joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control just begins to ooze out of your life. Why? Because you're good. Because Ken and Michelle are good. I mean, I think y'all are good people, but really, what's your source? It's Jesus Christ and his word. And that's what we set out to do. If you're a note taker, you can write it down um, from Psalm 119. The key, <laughs> the key is consistency. What you do and how you stay connected every day will be the key to your entire life, this consistent connection. Let's start in Psalm 119, verse 1. Again, this psalm is so beautiful. It's actually the way that the Jews would teach their children the alphabet. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and, and the way Psalm 119 is broken down, they take each like section, 22 of the alphabets, and eight verses all start with that letter in their alphabet. So the first one's Aleph, Aleph. And we need to change this with our kids because we just teach our kids like A for apple, B for boy. I think we need to like start teaching. They had to memorize the whole scripture, these kids. And so that's what this psalm's all about. And it's all about the word of God and the effects of the word of God. Psalm 119, starting in verse one. Watch this. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. Watch this, church, verse three. They do not compromise with evil. What's interesting, but pause real quick, just side note real quick. I think a lot of us like buffet Christianity. 
we're reading the Bible, we're like, yeah, I'll have a little bit of crab rangoon, but uh, I don't know about that part. And we're going through the buffet, the Chinese buffet of the Bible, and we're picking out places that we don't really like. The beauty of it, they don't compromise. It's like, whatever it is, all right, it's hard, but I'm gonna walk in it. Verse four, you have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently, there it is, reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. I wanna tell you how this, this started, this consistency in the scripture started for me. In 2000, Three months after I got married, by the way, imagine this, I, I was playing for the Miami Dolphins, and three months after I got married, I got cut and lost my job. Imagine, by the way, like being newly married and driving home to tell your wife, hey, sorry, babe, I have no job. And I thought my career was over. They started this wild league called the XFL, which was like the NFL meets WWF, and this guy I knew called me, he said, hey Todd, if you wanna continue your career, um, I want you on my team, I'm gonna draft you if you wanna play. I'm like, oh my goodness, let's go. And so training camp was gonna be in Las Vegas, so we started driving, and we stopped in Phoenix, Arizona on December 31st of 2000, and we rolled into this church, and this dude, this preacher is coming up on the stage, and he's like, and it was a smaller church, he said, he said, hey, listen, I'm gonna challenge every one of you guys. I know this is crazy. It's New Year's Eve. I, I wanna give you a challenge to read through the entire Bible in one year, in 2001. And I'm like, never in a million years. The whole Bible in one year? No way. I don't really like to read. You know, I like to run like a, you know, an in cut, you know, pluck and tuck. I don't got anything on. I don't like to read. No way. And the dude just kept on ranting and raving, kind of like I am right now. He's just like, no, bro, like, trust me. If you just take this discipline and read through the Bible, I promise you it'll change everything in your life. And so we're leaving, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know, bro. I, I mean, I might read a proverb every now and again. I might read when I feel like it, but man, I don't know. And so we're walking out of this little church, and he's like, hey, there's gonna be these reading guides, Bible and your reading guides on the way out. Just pick one up and take my challenge. So I start walking, and my amazingly beautiful and gifted and spirit-led wife on the way gives me that little elbow in the side <laughs> to kind of pick one up, and so I picked up two. Next day, we go to training camp, and we go to practice, and I was making the transition from quarterback to receiver, so I ran a lot. My legs got real sore. And the trick was, if you went into the cold tub after practice for 15 minutes every day, your, your legs would be revived for the next day. And I'm like, a bath with ice, ice water in Anybody cold tub people, where are they at, right? Cold tub people, try it out. I promise you, it is terrible, but it's beautiful. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna have to be in there for 15 minutes, I might as well do something productive. I took, that, I took that stupid reading guide and I would get in that tub, man. And we had these like little neoprene sleeves for, my, for the toes and we, oh, just do, oh, just get in it. And I had this like little mini Bible and my little reading guide. And I promise you, this is so true. January 1, 20, uh, 2001. I'm freezing, it's terrible. And I got this mini Bible, and the reading guide said, read Genesis chapter one and two, Matthew chapter one, and Psalm one. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just gonna start. And there was a homie next to me, Tommy Maddox. He was the quarterback. He, he was in another tub, and this guy knew the Bible. Whether or not he was following, I'm not sure at that time, but the dude knew the Bible. So I'm like asking him questions. I'm like, bro, we're having like a cold tub small group right here like in the locker room. And I'm like, this is terrible. But I'm just gonna do it. So the next day, what did I do? After practice, what did I do? Thank you. I have one, peop one person participating. Thank you. <laughs> Got in the ice bath. So what did I do? I brought my, my little mini-me Bible and this reading guide, and I started out again. And then on January 3rd, 
And then I, I'd be like, babe, it's not just me that you're doing it too. And my wife ate up the word. And so for the next, I don't know how many years, one day at a time, one day at a time, the key is consistency, one day at a time, in the cold tub or out of the cold tub, it's, it's, it was a non-negotiable in our life. It, it sounds ritualistic, legalistic, but listen, you have things you do every day, don't you? You wake up every day. How many, how many have a job? Right, raise your, you go to work every day. So here's, here's, a, here's a trick I learned. The reason why I was able to begin this discipline in my life, and by the way, it was drudgery at first, it became a discipline, and now it's a delight. Come on, somebody. But the thing was, I was gonna get in here every day in the cold tub, in the cold tub. I want, I, I'm gonna give you a trick, because some of you guys are like, I'm never getting in a cold tub ever in my life. It's not happening. So I don't know how I'm gonna develop this discipline. Here, here's, here's, a, here's a pro trick. What is it that you do every day that you could tie this Bible reading challenge together with it? So for example, Matt is doing one of these numbers. This is, this is what happened. So a couple of years later, you're like, why are you still in the cold tub? I don't know. Okay, you guys want me to get, <laughs> get out of the horse trough? Isn't it interesting that the horse feeds in this and then we become a self-feed? Ah, okay, so... A few years later, we were still reading through the Bible in a year every day. The kids, we were in Georgia by this time, the kids were toddlers. They, it was hard to have my quiet time and have toddlers running around. I didn't want to neglect my kids, but I wanted to stay connected in the word. And so I'm like, how do I do this? I had to go from the cold tub to my car. So what would happen, my beautiful wife would wake up early, prepare a great breakfast. By the way, breakfast eaters, come on now, stay with it. She, she would cook this amazing breakfast and then she would make me this caramel macchiato instead of spending you know, 10, 15 bucks on it, man. It was like for a dollar, 50 cents. She'd make it, I would eat, I would drink that, and I'd be all stoked and I would get up early enough to go, you know what, I, I need to get to work to the locker room 15 minutes early, stay in my car and read that daily reading. I'm like, dude, I'm going to work every day. So I tied it with that. What do you do every day? What do you do? Think about what you do every day, and then here's what you do. You, you, you move that into your rhythm, and you make it mandatory, not as a religious duty, but as an opportunity to not just start your race, to finish the race. Not that you just start on fire and then fizzle out. What is the key? The key is consistency. It's in the scriptures one day at a time. I'm, I promise you, man, whatever you are consistent with, the results will follow. If I, if I eat a Boston cream donut every day, guess what? The, the fruit will have, there'll be a donut right around here. It's what, <laughs> it, it's consistency. Someone say consistency. It, it's, it's what it's all about. And it's not just consistent reading. It's consistent applying. Not, not just, just reading it and then just f forgetting about it, but, but reading it and then walking in it. The New King James Version of verse one says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Watch James one. I love the scripture. Write this down in your notes. Go study it. James is so solid. He says, don't just listen to God's word in the cold tub. You must do what it says. How about that? Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. If you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself. You walk away. You forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the word of God, the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I love it. Not just reading consistently, but walking it out consistently as empowered by the spirit of God. James Montgomery Boy says this, watch this. The reason we're not happy is that we sin. <laughs> Straight up. And the main reason we sin as much as we do is we do not know the Bible well enough. Apart from being instructed by God, human beings do not know how to achieve happiness. We think we do. We're striving in all these different areas. And why am I so like crazy about trying to help you with this? Because man, I want you to thrive in life. I don't want us to walk blindly. I want to go with the word of God, with, with the, 
the manual for life, the playbook, and stay in it consistently. So consistency, man, it's key number two. Just, just recognize this. It is a lifetime of learning. I think a lot of times, man, when we come to Christ, we just want everything to be fixed tomorrow. Listen, you're saved in a moment, but you walk out your faith. You're sanctified is the Christian, the Christianese word of it. That's a lifetime. And the psalmist you're gonna see right here, he's humble enough to know that he's in process. And let me just tell you, let me give you good news. So are you, so am I. We never arrive. It's a lifetime of learning. Look at verse seven, Psalm 119 now, verse seven. This is so good. This is gonna set someone free right here. It says this, I, I put this in all caps. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. Look at this, I will obey your decrees. <laughs> look, look, look how he ends verse eight. Please don't give up on me. Anybody ever said that to like your spouse? Like, please don't give up on me. I know, man, I blew it again. Your boss, your coach, please. I, I, I gotta tell someone, man, it's, it's a process. As I learn, please don't give up on me. The scriptures are kind of like, um, it's like a mirror. And so when you look into the scriptures, you, you're reading it, and God's like making you aware of things that are a little bit off. Let me, just, let me just say this. He's not doing that to berate you or belittle you. He's doing it to help you grow. It's kind of like this. After, after football games, the next day we'd work out, and then we'd watch game film. Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Like, and the coach would critique what your, your plays. And I remember one time, man, my, I think it was my... My sophomore year, it was my sophomore year, because we went 0, 10, and 1, and I was the quarterback. Awesome, thank you, it was great. Not one victory the entire time, sick. And uh, one of the games, I got a deep thigh bruise, and the coach rewound the same play, like, I'm not lying, 15 times on the play that I got injured. Deep thigh bruise, I'm out for, I don't know, two games, something like that. Anybody have a deep thigh bruise? They're worse, by the way. So. I was trying to make a move on this guy, and I'm coming up to him, and I was planting off the left foot. And, he's, and the coach kept on rewinding it, because he's like, Todd, you never plant off the right foot. No wonder the defense knows where you're going. And that's why they came flying in and gave you the stinking deep thigh bruise with their helmet. She got flagged for that, but they didn't. That's how we used to play football back in the day. There's no, ah, yeah, it's bearing, whatever. No. Sorry about that, I don't know why that just happened. Uh, yeah, but here's the thing. He was rewinding it time and time again, and I got so mad at him. I'm like, dude, don't you have any grace at all? He's like, Todd, do you see this? The reason you're injured is because you're going off the wrong, ah! And I was so prideful. I wasn't, willing, I wasn't willing to receive it. It was the coach just trying to help me. It was the coach just saying, dude, I don't want you to be injured again. That's, that's part of reading the Bible. It's as I learn. If we're humble and coachable, guess what? He's gonna point out things. He's gonna be like, man, you, I, I've been challenging you to forgive that person, but you continue to stuff it, this bitterness and resentment, and you will not forgive. And that's why you're still injured, because you're cutting off the same foot. It's as I learn, as I learn. And he says this, as I learn. And then at the end, he goes, I love it. He goes, he goes don't give up on me. Anybody grateful for a God just who will never give up on you? No matter how many times you blow it, no matter how many times you get prideful. It, man, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for my coaches. In my junior year, after that 0-10-1 awesome campaign, in training camp, I, let, I quit. I quit in the middle of training camp. It was actually the first day. I walked out. And, oh man, I'm just... How about a coach that just won't let you quit? That's really what happened. So I walked out, and the head coach told my position coach, go take him out for a meal. Don't try to convince him to come back. Take, feed him. The dude's obviously out of his mind right now. Feed him a great chicken sandwich, all right, and let him go. I called, this is a true story. I called my mom. I was like, Mom, I have a terrible attitude. I can't be the leader of this team with this poor attitude. You gotta come pick me up. I'm transferring to Lincoln. I'm, I'm quitting football. 
And what did my mom, my mommy, mom, th- you know, mom's coming to rescue me. She, she leaves work. She drives three hours to Lames, Iowa. She shows up. I'm packing everything up in my house. This is true. And my position coach comes, when my mom gets there, we're about to leave, my position coach knocks on the door. He comes in. He's like, Todd, I've been thinking about it all practice long. And here's the question for you. Todd, do you want to let your teammates down by your attitude or by walking out on them? It was like the one phrase that my coach could have said to keep me in the game. (laughs) Can I just tell you, man, I'm so grateful for a coach who doesn't give up on me, man. I wouldn't be standing here today had I quit at that point. Maybe I just came, maybe you just came to church and that's all you needed to hear. Listen, God's not quitting on you. Do not quit. Listen, it's as you learn. It's a process. You might be injured right now, but man, you're, you're coming back. I'm prophesying to Blaze Doxon, our son right now. You might be injured right now, but man, God's gonna get you back in the game and you're gonna thrive. Don't believe the lie. It's not over. You're injured. You, you, I don't care what you have done. God's got a plan. He can forgive and get you back on the right track. I love that about God because we're all in process, man. The, the person that's like shining their halo, the Christians like acting like they got everything together, Man, don't believe that hype. You come as you are, but don't leave the same way as you got in here, man. Let the coach coach you. The scriptures, that's the beauty of this whole process. Okay. I wish I had more time. This is the last point. Jot it down real quick. We'll cover it briefly because, again, we don't want to just start the race. We want to finish. We don't want to start on fire and fizzle out. Listen, we want to be in it for the long haul. Number three, hide it in your heart. This scripture, man, we eat it and just get it down in your heart, man. Memorize it. Get it in your heart. Verse nine, the psalmist asking this question, how can a young person stay pure? In the New King James, I think it it says, um, how can a young man cleanse his way or a young woman cleanse their way by obeying your word? I've tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. What a great prayer, by the way, of the psalmist. Don't let me wander. My tendency as a human is just to wander, just to to get distracted. So easy for me to get distracted. Don't let me wander. And then he says this, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I think there's a lot of people that are reading the word, it's getting to their head, but some, for some reason, it doesn't seep into the heart. One of the things that's helped us, again, just a little pro tip for you to consider. When we were in Bible college, it was, it was amazing. We got this challenge to write down some memory verses on these index cards, these three by five uh, index cards, and then there was like a, what do you call that, like a, like a ring that you would have with it, And so you'd write it out, and then Denise and I would quiz each other before we went to bed every night. See how we're tying it together? Do you go to bed every night? Anybody? You go to bed every night? So pair that with something, right? It's something you do regularly, right? If it's not the cold tub, you go to bed every night, so pair it together with something. Be consistent. Find your hot tub, or find your cold tub to stay hot. That's really what the idea is. And so we were pregnant with the twins, we meaning her, I mean, she was carrying the twins, but we had two kids in the bucket, and they, the doctor was like, rub some body butter on that thing, so I'd be like praying in the spirit, like over the belly, over the kids, like prophesying, making sure those stretch marks wouldn't come, you know, I was going to, and, uh, and D Money would then have the little scripture, and she'd be like reading it, and then she, and then she would say, she'd start it, or she'd say like where it's found, and she would ask me the verse, And then we'd go back and forth. And you know what the beauty of that was? It was God's word seeping from the head down into the heart. When you hide it in your heart, you're guarded against the enemy. You remember Jesus? What did he do when the the enemy came to tempt him? How about it? 40 days in the wilderness, he was fasting. He comes out 
and, and the enemy comes and attacks him. And what did, what did you, every single attack, there was three attacks specific, every time how do you respond? It is written. It is written. You know how he weathered the storm, he got through it, is he had the word of God, he is the word of God, but he had the word of God deep in his heart. Hide it in your heart. You wanna stay pure? You wanna finish the race? You wanna not get hoodwinked by the enemy? Hide it in your heart. I joke around about the process of this. In Romans 12, too, it says, it says this, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Some people make fun of me. Todd, you've been brainwashed by the church. I'm like, heck yeah, bro. I needed a good brainwash, and I still do. If y'all been scrolling social media, man, you need a good brainwashing, good heart washing. Why? Because we gotta earn our way to heaven? Listen, no, the blood of Christ is the only way any of us are making it to heaven, not by our good works. But why? So you could experience God's best and not just start the race, but you finish it. You finish it. I wanted to give you a picture and then I'll let you go of what this looks like. There was a, a storm that went through Texas way back in 2008. I think it was Hurricane Ike. And yeah, you'll see the picture here. Talk about damage. I mean, completely wiped out. In this neighborhood, in this community, there were 200 houses. 200. Guess how many survived, church? That's a picture of Christianity. You know how many people start out the journey but actually remain? to their last days where they can, they've taken their last breath and they're like, you know what? Like, you, like Paul, you can just say, man, I've walked through it, but I've finished my course with joy. And that picture is such a great picture because the story behind it, another storm a few years before came through and on that same exact place, they had a house that didn't make it and it was torn down. And they're like, hey, we gotta do something different. They love the area so much, they hired a different contractor who built this house differently, a little bit higher, a little bit solid base, and guess what? Because of their transition to a different builder, their house remained. Some of y'all been building on the wrong foundation, man, and the time is coming where God's saying, man, I want you to experience my best, and I want you to finish the race. It's time to call a different contractor. His name is Christ. Jesus said it very clearly in Matthew 7. So solid. Listen to this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. It's like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain, the hurricane Ike comes, in torrents and the flood, flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house. It will not collapse. Why? Because it's built on bedrock, the word of God. And then it continues on and says, man, if you don't, it's gonna be wild how the house falls. It's not God's heart. It's not my heart. Place your faith every single day. Stay consistent in the scriptures. Know it's a process. Hide it in your heart. Let God give you the power to finish your race well, amen? Thank you, Lord, for this, this timely word. So many coming to Christ right now, so many just catching fire for you. And so we pray now, not just starting well, but finishing well, even through the tough times, the setbacks, the disappointments, the diseases, we pray we'd stay steady as we stay connected to you and your scriptures every single day. Not as a religious routine, but a beautiful opportunity to meet with you, intimacy with you, relationship with you, opening our eyes, giving us power to live it out. And even now, perhaps someone never has started this race with you, we pray today would be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name.